These wonderful four days have been not just about uh, experiencing uh, different problems and different solutions, but also, as, as the name of the Institute implies, uh, different cultures and uh, quite a, a change between the, the, the culture of the, the first evening with uh, pasta, the Italian restaurant, and uh, the culture of German food yesterday evening with the sauerkraut, sausages, and... Uh, I, I'm still digesting this food, I think, from yesterday evening. <laughs> Is that a compliment? <laughs> it's a compliment, yes. Um, before we uh, start the panel, I, I just uh, was intrigued by uh, uh, Mr. Arsini's uh, speech earlier, and uh, um, I, I want to, to get an honest reply from the audience. Uh, we are all simultaneously here, I'm sure, citizens of the globe, of the world, but we all come from different countries. You know, we get China, America, Germany, the Maldives, wherever we come from. Uh, but, and we all have this identity. We have a global identity and we have a national identity. And hand on heart, no lies, we're amongst friends. Which identity is the first identity that you think of? If you think that your identity as, as a Chinese person or a British person or as, a, as, a, as a, a French person, Dutch, Ecuadorian, is the first national identity, the first identity you think of. Could you raise your hands, please? And if you see yourself, firstly, as a, as a citizen of the globe, a world citizen first, first and foremost, before your national identity, could you raise your hand? Oh, 50-50, I would say, yeah? Um, yeah. If this was in Britain, it would be slightly different, I imagine. But <laughs> Okay, so we are, we are halfway there to creating maybe a, a, a global identity. Uh, now, we're amongst friends. I think you've met everybody before, but very quickly, we have... Our uh, former Estonian Prime Minister at the age of 18, I believe, you first became Prime Minister, was it slightly older? Sli slightly older. Yeah. And we have uh, uh, Vasily Puskas, the former Foreign Minister of uh, Romania, and our, our good friend Gerasim Oasinas, former um, Economic Minister and uh, Head of the Bank of Greece. And then our old friend, the friend of the British tabloid press, Mr. Jack Poos, former Deputy Prime Minister of Luxembourg and uh, former President of the Council of Europe. And then our quietest member of the panel, <laughs> Professor Derpak Pant, uh, a global intellectual. And finally, we have uh, Solomon Passi, who's uh, not only a, a former uh, Foreign Minister of Bulgaria, but also formerly head of the OSCE in Europe. Um, I'd like to, to throw out first a, a question. Uh, it also touches on a, on, a, on a cultural issue as we're at the ICD. We've heard a lot about um, the rise uh, of China and the, uh, the, uh, the stunning growth of that country uh, and also of India as well. And I'm wondering uh, maybe if I could uh, open this up to uh, maybe uh, our good friend Madla. Does this rise of, of China and India, countries which are, are, are very far away from the, uh, the European and Western experience, does this mean that uh, we are looking at the end of the West? Is a modern, rich China and a modern, rich India, is, is that a Western concept? Or is modernity, does it have many different faces? Um, we will see. <laughs> but... Um I think first of all, the China and India, uh, I'm not expert in this part of the world, but for me, they look quite different. And um, I must say, looking on the future, the Indian model looks to me more sustainable as a China one. Because with even all the problems and lacks and, and whatever happens in India, uh, that's democracy. With all the misgivings and problems. 
but um, in China, it's not. And soon in one former panel, it was mentioned that it can and it will be once the problem in China because there are some developments in the world which always happen, which means um, to develop the China needs the middle class. When the middle class comes, then the one party rule or some kind of communist control is in danger. When it goes into danger in China, it's, it means problem. The second area, of course, is in China are those enormous challenges inside of the country. When you look at the amount of the social protests in China, they are not going, growing so, they are growing so thanks to this very large contrast in the country between the cities and the countryside. The second area is environment, which is really a serious problem because the communists never take care of the environment. They are a lot of more, even more bad as capitalists in the former former centuries in this sense. And um, this is a real problem. And what worries me most is that the uh, West is not dealing with these challenges at all. For the West, uh, China looks like a former Soviet Union. Looked for the West, the country where only Russians are living, when there is no, in China there are enormous amount of nationalities, which we somehow just miss because for us only Chinese are living in China, which is not exactly so how it is. And um, we are just not giving the attention on all these problems what are existing inside the China. And when now something happens, and when in China something happens, looking on the history as I am historian, so and, and it happens very badly and for a long time, what will happen to the Western economy? We are so connected, we are in very much dependent, but I even not noticed even any discussion what will happen with us when something happens in China. Uh, what will happen to the neighboring countries, to the whole area? It's, um, it's, it's one of the big challenges during the coming decade, actually. And, um, and I, I don't think that we can avoid something happening there, but at least we must a little bit think and prepare ourselves that such of things can happen and what we will do because I don't think that we are having, unfortunately, the answer. Because again, as I said soon before, as historian, there will be more crises. There will be even more hard when we are not, when we stay too optimistic. Uh, I'm actually myself, I'm trying to be always optimist, but sometimes when I'm looking on the world and world leaders, uh, I think that we are having some curement against the danger in the world, so something I think we must have curement against optimism also, because when you are very, very optimistic all the time, then you miss all the problems, and then they will hit even more badly. Um, but as I said, former India, I think that's a country which we need to look on. There are a lot of, lot of interesting things going on there. Again, with all the problems and misgivings and whatsoever, I'm not so good expert that I can describe this, but looking a little bit from the far away, it looks it looks very interesting. The topic of our panel uh, should be new uh, economic world order, new major players and challenges. We have a reshuffling of the economic order, of the economic system, but without order. And uh, I would like to share with you the uh, latest study which was published uh, beginning this week by PricewaterhouseCoopers, which is not a rating agency, so I trust it because it's an auditing, uh, worldwide auditing firm. And uh, they made a study about what would happen in the next 10 and 20 years. And this is the result. In 10 years, 2020, we will ha have an E7, Emerging Countries 7. 
These are the BRIC countries, with which you know, plus Mexico, Turkey, and Indonesia. And this E7 will have an aggregate GMP higher than the G7, which you know. This is a major change which will be, happen, will be happening. Second, in 20 years, 2020, we will have the following order of countries classified according their aggregate GNP, not the per capita. The aggregate GNP, number one, China, number two, United States of America, number three, India. This will be the world ranking in 20 years. Are we prepared to that? Not at all, not at all. We, Dr. Puskas this morning presented us different schemes of how uh, we should adapt, how we should uh, restructure, refund the existing uh, institutions. Uh, this process has rarely, has, uh, has not started, really, has not started really. We have the G20, but is the G20 a representative? Has it a legal foundation? Uh, this is an informal gathering, the G20, an informal gathering of uh, heads of states and government of 20 countries. Have they amended from their parliaments? Not, a, uh, not an official one. And the countries which are not represented in the G20, what are, uh, what are their rights? Uh, what should they do if there is a decision of the G20 to be implemented? No answers uh, to all these questions. That why I think that when restructuring the world economic order, we should take as a fundament, as a basis, the existing institution, like the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, the World Trade Organization. They are reformable, but at least they, are, they have rules and they represent every country of the world. There are no left outs. Even the smallest country have a say in these institutions. Last remark, independence for me, interdependence for me is not a challenge but an opportunity. It will bring new wealth to the developing countries, billions of people will enter the, the economic process and it will also bring uh, opportunities to the developed countries because of the unmeasurable needs which exists in the developing countries and which can be partly covered by exports from our side. Two conditions fight protectionism, because these huge changes will uh, trigger protectionist tendencies, especially from the developed countries against the developing ones. And second, avoid warlike uh, conflicts, war for resources, access to the resources, terminate the existing conflicts and avoid to initiate new ones, but this will be the theme of my conference of this afternoon. Thank you, Gret. Thank you very much. Um, I think that um, there is not a problem with um, appearance of new, uh, uh, new actors, if you are talking about China, India, Brazil, or others. Uh, it is a problem only if we think in terms of uh, veto actors. And uh, veto actors uh, today practically are blocking, and even today, are blocking reforming both UN system and other agencies. You know. Why? 
because they are uh, states or actors looking only for power relations into the world system, are not talking about, you know, a truly uh, a world relationship or uh, solving world affairs. We were talking in 18th century and 19th century about European centuries, which I was criticized, Eurocentric, you know, approach of uh, uh, 18th, 19th century. 20th century was so-called American century. 21st century perhaps will become Pacific century. But only if we are talking about so-called geostrategic axis from the perspective of power relationship. Continuing to block these changes, transformation of the international system will open the gate to new type of actors. Non-state actors will become very strong and will find the way of acting within international system, including with states, including with uh, uh, force, if necessary. Take in consideration 1972, AT&T, Chile. They did employ an army to solve the problem. It is a problem to talk about sovereignty, about currency and, and uh, army. It is not a problem for a big transnational corporation or other. But as Alexander Wendt said, we'll face, and we are facing right now, the involvement of, of a so-called agent, and I told network uh, 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 actors, which are trying to find a way to, to, to uh, implement their uh, goals into the uh, international uh, system. About China. Uh, China did prove, uh, uh, fortunately, I, I did visit China for first time in 2000. After 10 years, in 2009, I visited again. And half of my route was in 2009, the same with 1990, uh, 2000. And truly, I was impressed about changes. Not only investment in infrastructure, not only economic changes, but changes within the people, institutions. We have to take in consideration this kind of transformation. If we are not, uh, 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 you know, supporting these changes within international system, will not become only conservative, will not become only traditionalist but will block the development and will find again, will meet again a sort of new crisis. And look, I fully agree with Wallerstein. A crisis means that actors didn't solve a problem, didn't change what they wanted to do. You know, why, if we know what does mean a crisis, why we like to enter the crisis and to change to transform only after the crisis, and with consequences, with the cost of crisis. That's why I am a, a, a fan of managing international relations, and I fully agree from my perspective, both interconnectivity and interdependence must be, you know, a, a huge opportunity, both for states and for non-state actors, and not be afraid from uh, uh, non-state actors. Well, I want to pick up the point that uh, you raised from the very beginning. We are all citizens of the same planet. We are citizens of the world. But uh, we have our own cultural and ethnic identities. And uh, there are differences. Uh, in uh, the hardcore of our values, the way we see the world, life, the relations among other people. And I think it is good 
that there is a diversity in this uh, planet. And let me remind you that the proud moments of global civilizations came out of mixture of cultures and uh, through a dialogue of people with different backgrounds and cultures. After all, the Greek, ancient Greek civilization was not produced only in Greece. It took actually influences from India, from Mesopotamia, and from many other countries. The Renaissance, Egypt, the Renaissance period uh, in uh, Europe was not a European phenomenon, was a, a cross influence of many other cultures as well. So with this remark, let me now proceed. We have in 21st century a new situation. The big players in the past were more or less dominant players of the same so-called Western culture. That was between uh, France and Germany, United States and Europe, oh, Japan maybe after the war. But uh, uh, the club was a Western club. Now, if we go to what uh, you uh, was just said, that in, 19, uh, in uh, 2030, the big producers will be China, India, uh, United States, and so forth, then the dominant economic and therefore political players will be of different cultures. Now, do we have the institutional framework for dealing with this issue in an, our international organizations? The idea is that uh, we're very slow in reforming the international system to accommodate uh, this big structural change, which is not only a change in the production, it's a change in the distribution and the relative powers of cultures as well. Now, let me add another more complicated factor, is that um, after the mobility of capital, we're living now in the period of mobility of labor. Now, Europe, in the next two decades, uh, will receive about uh, 50 million people, immigrants, from Middle East and from Africa. Now, Europe will become a multicultural society, and uh, we do not have a policy in our democracies how we deal this issue of migration. Are we going to have multicultural societies where ethnic groups will live side by side peacefully with their different tradition and so forth? Or that will be a process of assimilation, accepting influences from other cultures as well. Uh, because in this conference, many problems and crises were mentioned, environment crisis, financial crisis, and so forth. I do want to insist on this, that uh, before those crises uh, appear or reappear, we will have the problem of settling in our democracies the multicultural phenomenon of our times. And there again, we're very slow in adapting to new situations. And we have to address ourselves to this uh, issue. And I again say that uh, meeting different cultures is an opportunity. It's not a problem for us. But uh, we have actually to make sure that the social and economic policies will be such that will facilitate people of different cultures to come together and talk to each other equal to unequal and not uh, to have phenomena of exploitation and ghetto policies. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, um, Mr. Passi, I, I, I know you wanted to comment on, on this subject, but could I also add a, another little qualifier here? Um, as somebody who was head of a, of a European organization, uh, we've heard a lot of talk over the last few days about um, um, Europe is good at this or not good at that, but it strikes me that with maybe to some extent U.S. power on the wane over the last few years with um, 
difficulties in the, in, in the Middle East, the, 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 the economic uh, uh, problems. Has Europe or is Europe being too modest? Should we step up to our responsibilities, maybe in a more, can I say, assertive way? Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, being our attention being uh, attracted uh, by the Middle East and other crisis area, we possibly miss uh, an important opportunity to focus ourselves on uh, uh, really big priorities. And uh, I would say that uh, China is uh, one of the biggest uh, priorities which uh, we're missing at this moment. Uh, I listened with great interest uh, everybody, but in particular Vasily Pushkas, uh, who mentioned uh, something about the Security Council, and uh, he reminded me that a couple of years ago when I was uh, on the Security Council uh, representing Bulgaria, then uh, uh, we were talking about the uh, reforms in the, in the Security Council in the UN system, and uh, one old diplomat told me, you young men, you were born after the war, and you do not remember that the United Nations was made by five countries to serve five countries. So don't expect uh, uh, very sp uh, speed uh, reforms in this organization. Uh, uh, the West, uh, uh, I, I would say that the West does not understand China. Uh, I'm part of the West and I am representative of those who do not understand, do not know China. I'm not expert on China. Uh, maybe this is uh, uh, the big reason why we fail to engage China. We need China on board, and this is, uh, uh, I think, uh, should be our political priority for the next uh, decade. Uh, there is a very big difference between India and China, and no one better than a Nepali colleague uh, could say about this. The uh, difference between China and India is huge. They cannot be compared. India is, first of all, uh, uh, oriented to herself, while, uh, while uh, China is oriented to the outside world. Uh, China is um, the future colonial power. However, China is not colonizing uh, uh, the world by force. China is colonizing uh, the world by investment. Wherever you go, in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, you will see the Chinese investments, which uh, investments will produce results in a decade, two decades from now, and uh, we shall wake one day and we shall see that China is everywhere. And uh, moreover, the Chinese are very active in, uh, attract in uh, inviting foreign students uh, in, uh, uh, in, in China, which uh, creates another type uh, of, of law uh, for China uh, to the uh, and another kind of bridge for China to the external wor world. Uh, I think that uh, we shouldn't uh, even dream of uh, having uh, immediate uh, democratic elections in China according to the dem democratic standards here in Berlin, for example. If someone decides to open democratic elections in China for next year, uh, maybe uh, most the most pro probable scenario is that a Maoist party will win by 70% or 80% and will ruin all of uh, what has been achieved in the last two or three decades. So this is a very dangerous game. China cannot uh, go democ uh, cannot d democratize uh, overnight. China needs uh, to take time. And uh, here again, the West does not understand very well the Chinese uh, mentality because the, the leading principle of the Chinese behavior is the dignity. If uh, we try to press them from outside we the only th and to corner them, the only thing which we achieve is humiliation. And the humiliation is counterproductive for the Chinese. Uh, what uh, we can try to do is to try to engage them in uh, our uh, world by, uh, by s s special formats. For example, one uh, format which I believe will be very uh, well placed and uh, very useful will be a NATO China Council. We need a constant di dialogue between uh, China and NATO because China is the only permanent member of the Security Council with which uh, NATO does not have any kind of relationship. So once adopting the NATO-China Council, we shall have different relations between NATO and the uh, UN system as a whole. Uh, okay, I think that that's enough.
I wanted to say also something for ASEAN, but I will leave it for another time. Okay. Th thank you very much. Uh, before moving on to Professor Pant, I'd, I'd just like to give a, a very quick word to, to Mr. Martela, because I know he has a, another election to fight. He has to uh, nip away a little bit early today. So. To be very frank, not election, my plane just leaves. <laughs> That's a typical politic politician who finds the excuse some important jobs to leave, but to be honest, I think that's good to be honest here, that's just the play. Uh, but um, uh, first of all, I must say, just as conclusion from my part, that I really have enjoyed to be there because uh, I think what we have found together that uh, culture is more important as we maybe sometimes think. And it means that the cultural diplomacy is an uh, important tool also. One thing which I want nevertheless say is uh, that's that's important to remember also that to have the cultural diplomacy, you need to have culture. And um, this again is connected with identity, with each of our identity. When we all become the world citizens at once, then we couldn't have diplomacy. And do we want this or not? But we are different. And what um, we must love in the world is namely this diversity what we have in Europe and in the world, and to namely learn how to live each other with all these differences. I think that's, that's most important what we must achieve. And that is possible to achieve. We have demonstrated this in Europe. Look on the Europe. Nowhere in the world you are finding so large diversity, such an amount of cultures, languages, uh, nations, and all of them nearly have been in the war. Um, and we have started two world wars from Europe. And now, to be very frank, it's, it's even not possible to imagine to, at least from Europe, to start the third one. And I think this is a big achievement that it demonstrates that you, you can keep the diversity and to build the good synthesis from, from this, even as it sometimes looks a little bit important, this synthesis, but, but it's, it's working. And uh, that's, that's what I always suggest, to be who you are and to love other people how they are and to understand them. I think that's, that is really important. And just a large message on the, I, I wanted when I could stay to argue a lot of on the, on the China and again what is hard to, to understand, but a lot of our talks today that we must engage, we must understand China is different, that China is not a country where you can build the Western democracy. I think that's all true, I, I agree with this. But it so reminds me what was talked on the Soviet Union. It's a country, again, Stalin maybe was bad, but you must understand him because it can be even more worse. Or Brezhnev was bad, but you must understand him because it can be even more worse. The Gorbachev was maybe it killed some people also, but you must understand it because otherwise comes the more bad people. I've heard this so much, living from inside of this country, and uh, and not understanding what the world is talking for. This was the evil empire. The only way to deal with this was to crush it, and at the end it was done. Thank God. The, all those nice talks they are not understood by the dictatorship. Dictatorships. When you go to them and have a very pleasant talk and avoid talking frank and directly, then they understood that you are weak. And from this point of view, nothing changes and nothing happens. And, uh, and at the same time, I think we must talk more with India and with the neighboring country of China because this was, was mentioned true, that China is orientated outside. And there are countries who are can get to the problems. I think we must really talk and deal with the, all this region to be honest, not to humiliate anybody, but to be very frank. Because otherwise we will not achieve the goals. And again, when I am talking and hearing that the Chinese people, they're just not democratic people. Look on Taiwan. There is a working democracy in Taiwan. Of course, it took time, but the people are the same. The culture is the same, and it's really working. Why not? in other places, of course, not immediately, I agree with this. It takes time, but when we are not, at least ourselves are trying to make the difference what that is, actually we are undermining China itself. 
because, as I told, in one moment it's dangerous for China, and which means for all of us, not to take these steps. Um, and at the end, when again it becomes too pessimistic, I, I only want to thank you all of you who are organizing these events, who are inviting us, all these young people who are idealistic and, and future orientating and, and looking forward. I think that's very important. Really, again, stay who you are, and when you are making yourself better, the world will really change and become better itself. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mark. <laughs> Professor Pant, it, it strikes me that you are in a, a unique position because you come from a country which is squashed right between China and India, the two emerging powers. And uh, um, one would think, uh, although you argued against it before, that maybe you would be interested in uh, some, some global governance structures and uh, to, to resist this colonization for investment possibility that we've talked about from China. I'd, I wonder if you could give a, a specific uh, Nepalese perspective on, uh, on, on where you think the, the Nepalese independence and national identity and uh, uh, future power to determine its own uh, fate lies when you are between two of the great emerging powers. Uh, well, I have already lost my Nepalese perspective. I have, I've got now an extreme lands perspective, and they are in several parts of the world. <coughs> I keep on moving around, so there's no more Nepal only. But I know, happen to know both countries, India and China, and personally, because of friendship and because of some education and work. And I was trained as a pilot in India, and I was a visiting professor in China, and w went five times to China, and crisscrossed all China, all environmental systems of China, uh, from the desert of Xinjiang to the taiga of Manchuria, all by land. So I got a view of China. And then I c what I could say is that now, everything can be speculation. What will be the future? We don't know. But I see this, uh, an alternative image of the future is not a new, good, well-fixed order, but a shift in the alliance. So far, the very center of the global political, economic, and military power has been North Atlantic, the two sides of the northern part of the hemisphere, Atlantic. And that may shift in a few years. And the new alliance, the new axis could be India, China, and Japan. And that they, this, they, nobody has thought about the Oriental Alliance. There can be formidably powerful alliance that culturally, militarily, industrially, and technologically re-equilibrates the w global scenario. Because the India has the technological and cultural power. Chinese have the, it is the manufacturing yard of the world. They have the industrial logistic capacity. Japanese has the same technology and industrial capacity, both. So the new possibility, one possibility I say, is the new Oriental Alliance. Of course, that will need a lot of differences, solving internal differences. Contrary to the Westerners, Europeans and Americans, the differences between Japan, China, and India, nobody preaches the other. They don't lecture each other. India doesn't lecture on liberal democracy to China. They have their differences. They have also some problems, border problems, not yet solved, all the border problems. But Indians are really a solid liberal democracy, one of the most stable democratic institutions in the world, more democratic than half of Europe. Half of European Union, it's more democratic and liberal, India. It's a really good example. but. They don't lecture Chinese on human rights, on liberal democracy, on free and multi-party elections. They don't lecture. Japanese don't lecture the Chinese. Chinese don't lecture the Indians. They don't lecture. The Westerners have this vice of lecturing the others. They want to preach the others. This is the first thing. And then this will be countered very soon. Very soon it will be countered by this new Oriental alliance. 
it may take 15 years, 10 years, or 20 years, they won't lecture the uh, Europeans. They will only counter and make new conditions of trade and global patrolling the satellites, the blue water navy, ocean going vessels, and the long strategic bombers crisscrossing globe and watching ram. And they're working on it. And the Russians will be in a unique position to mediate between the Westerns, the Westerns who are already, will be already fed up of lecturing others by that time, and will be already weakened by their aging population, lack of creativity, lack of new kids, a tired uh, civilization. They will be, the Russians will be in a unique position to, to mediate between the Oriental Alliance and the Westerners. And the Russians will enjoy their strategic depth. Russians never win anybody, but nobody can win Russia. <laughs> you have to think about that. It's unwinnable. You see? And they will be in the unique position to deal with that. I'm just making a very alternative scenario, an image of future. So, and besides this alliance, now what is the difference between India and China? We'll talk later about it. And then other, uh, other actors, there are non-state actors, very strong, emerging. There will be some very violent, some very positive, and some very strange. Now, the most violent actors, they are going to be stronger. Because again, this guy, like Al-Qaeda, this is a, the most global non-governmental organization. It's the biggest NGO that inspires millions, has a doctrine, has a solution, has an idea of a future, and is able to win the heart and minds, and has resources. They are very smart. They play on, the, on, on, on more than 50% of the stock exchange of the world. Before any attempt, watch the listings. Who is buying what and who is selling what? You haven't watched that very care carefully. They have a military committee. They have a financial committee. They have a communication committee, and they have a doctrine committee, four committees, four commissions. These are, and then they, they have the new options. And then one of the new, very important options in Africa is called Al-Shabaab, means the youth, the new, young, educated, West-returned youngsters of Africa. Somalia is their hub now, because it's the most lawless area. So it's there, but they are not only Somalis. There are many black and non-black Africans and non-Africans who are creating Al-Shabaab, the youth, the new youth. This is the post-modern, post-industrial, post-Western radical Islamics. And they are not Bedouins. They know technology. They use internet more smarter than many national governments. The web, their, their management of the web. So, and the other actor, other actors will be, non-state actors will be, united traditions of the world. No more United Nations. The traditions, united traditions of the world. The uh, American Indians, the Amazonian Indians, and they, were, they have a stake in their areas. Nobody is giving them pro intellectual property right, but they are using their traditional ethnobotanic knowledge to make pharmaceutical products. But their intellectual property is not recognized. They are non-entities under this uh, disguise of the nation states and administrative quarters. Now they are going to be, how do we say, they will unhook themselves from the territorial administrative division and they will create a new network of united traditions of the world. That's new coming. Here you will see the Buddhists, the Hindus, the Tao, and who will be the most antagonistic element for them? The Abrahamic, Semitic, monotheistic structural traditions. They will see. These are the warmongers of the world. They are the ones who have gone around the world trying to preach and convert the others and create problems. This will be a new kind of configuration, geocultural antagonism. And the Islam will be on the defensive side in that moment. It's a converting, evangelizing religion, proselytic. So these non-proselytics, the polytheists, the self-contained traditions will create united traditions of the world. 
and that will be a new, new strange development would be. And there are Europeans, some Europeans will join them. You'll see that. The, 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 the call of the wilderness is very strong in Europe. You don't underestimate that. Richiamo della selva, in Italian they would say. So these are the new, new developments that I foresee somehow. This some, some of the alternative images of the future. About India and China, internal differences. It's very minor, but there are. We'll talk about that later. Thank you very much. Okay, there's only about 14 different subjects there we, uh, we could uh, uh, Mr. Passe, uh, do you, like uh, Professor Pad, look forward to the day when Russia, uh, as, as a former foreign minister of Bulgaria, do you look forward to the day when Russia is the mediator between, uh, for, 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 Russia, uh, for the European Union and the, the Oriental Alliance? I was very pleased to uh, hear what Professor Panta said because uh, he really is a person who understands this world. <laughs> and uh, th I very strongly agree with him that uh, our biggest deficiency in communication to the East that we are trying to lecture them. I'm sorry that the Estonian Prime Minister is not anymore uh, together with us, but uh, I would say that uh, China, as uh, uh, in contrast with uh, Iraq or Yugoslavia, cannot be bombed. Uh, this, is, uh, this we have to understand. Uh, so we need, uh, uh, we need a kind of a deepening dialogue which will lead to a smoother democratization of this country. And indeed, I very much uh, agree with uh, what uh, Professor Panta said about the mediation role of Russia between the East and the West. This is uh, uh, something that we should better try to avoid, and that's why if we have uh, such a West China structures like the NATO China uh, Council or uh, other similar, we shall avoid this absolutely unnecessary uh, uh, mediation of Russia. Uh, moreover, this mediation of Russia uh, does not help us to solve other problems through the Security Council. For example, uh, we, we could not pass uh, resolutions in the Security Council for Burma because of the uh, ch uh, Russian-Chinese block there. If uh, none of the countries in the Security Council is happy to impose veto alone, uh, but if there are the two of them, then the veto becomes much easier uh, job. And uh, speaking again about the differences between India and China, we have to uh, have in mind that India has, uh, uh, is a founding member, founder of uh, the non-aligned movement. And uh, India has such a thinking. They have a non-aligned thinking. So if uh, they rush for a new uh, alliance, they will have, first of all, to quit the non-aligned movement, uh, which I think will be good, uh, because the non-aligned movement is an obsolete organization at this moment. Uh, it is uh, when, we didn't, uh, w when we lost the second world, uh, we, we don't need a third world anymore. Thank, thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to open the discussion up to the floor in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, but before I do, I'd, I'd like... Um, Jacques to to provide some comments on this, uh, also regarding Russia, and also uh, as well um, as somebody who was, I think, three times uh, president of the Council of Europe. Uh, at European, European Council. European Council of Europe. Yeah. Um, that is Europe really ready to take or, or to wake up, to step up to this role? And I know that you are. Uh, a great protagonist for keeping the nation states in Europe, not for centralization, more for decentralization. But isn't it time that we got rid of this democratic deficit so we enabled us to work together more and more as a, as a union in order to step up to this role? Thank you. Um, as always, I, I admire the, the brilliant intervention of uh, Professor Pan. But uh, I must uh, disagree uh, with his conclusions, uh, seeing Russia as a mediator between uh, an Asian axis, not an axis of evil, of course, and Europe. Uh, I think that China, that China doesn't, wouldn't accept it, and China wants directly, direct contacts with the European Union. That was my impression during many, many uh, 
state uh, trips to, to China, discussing with the, with the authorities, uh, they saw European Union as an alternative to the dependency from the United States. That's why China is advocating a multipolar world. And in this multipolar world, they see Europe as one of the poles, which, uh, as your last uh, question indicates, uh, is not entirely perfect. But we could do something about it, and especially about the foreign policy, about uh, speaking with one voice when we are discussing with China, with Russia, with, in, with India, and so we have to come away from the veto role in the uh, expression of the foreign policy of the European Union. Thank you. Uh, Professor Pant, you wanted to yeah. do a, a quick response? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well one thing is that I, I was not meaning really the mediation of Russia as an exclusive mediation. I mean, but Russian will be in a uniquely privileged position because they have a special contact with both Russia and with China and India, maybe less with Japan. But both countries, they have a very strong historical, cultural, and political ties. So I, I may not, they may not be the real mediator. It's true that India and China both are looking for more multipolar world and they don't want direct contact with the European Union. It is true. It is, it is absolutely true. But the Russians will anyhow will be in a privileged position. Undermining them or forgetting them will not help us. And the, the second thing is that I would like to say non-aligned movement is dead. Do you know that? After the, after the end of the Berlin Wall, that, that union became only a photo opportunity for some years. Now nobody even talks about it. They still gather ceremonially because the Indonesia, India, and the Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia of Tito, he, they, were, they were the one who didn't want to make part of the NATO or they want to, want to make part of the Warsaw Pact. So they created the so-called the third way of that time, and then they became the third world. Because that third way, they were out in the cold. And they were completely ineffective. They have never been effective. And then after that, they, they lost interest. Because now the new strategic partnership is, bet is between India and the United States. They are the real uh, allies in, 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 the, in the Eastern Hemisphere because they trust more each other. They have more trade also. They have more scientists coming and going. They both use English. They have more technological connection. 30% of the new entrepreneurs of the Silicon Valley were Indians. And many of them go back and forth from India, Bangalore to, to, to San Francisco. And they, so these are the things. Here we are, here the, 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 the Oriental Alliance is a more deep and cultural reality that may take have to happen. I just only made an alternative image of the future. I wanted to stimulate your imagination instead of saying the same thing that everybody is saying. But non-aligned movement is dead. Th thank you very much for that very very quick comment, uh, Professor Pan. Um, could I give the last word to uh, Foreign Minister Vasily Puskin? Thank you. Very briefly, um, Russia. Um, can be a mediator for a specific topic in a specific context. I cannot believe Russia can be a mediator in the sense of balance of power. I cannot believe it. Uh, Russia has uh, uh, 10 more years to try to modernize itself, to use its resources. If doesn't use resources in order to modernize itself, both economically, socially, and institutionally, I cannot see, you know, the possibility to, to do that. Second issue, regarding European uh, Union. I, I told, and uh, uh, during my presentation, um, European Union is in a um, privileged position to act globally in a multilateral environment because you know has European Union has few advantages is a multilateral structure 
has intellectual tools of cooperation, coordination, and communication, has resources, both financial and political resources. Unfortunately, European Union missed two very important issues, leadership, global leadership, and global vision. Without these two, I cannot believe European Union can be. I would like to see European Union as a global player, but not saying, I would like to use uh, soft power, not hard power. I would like to see European Union saying, as I told you in June, using smart power, not in traditional way, the power issue, but in a new way. I think it is absolutely necessary to have both vision and leadership, and we miss. And I cannot see in short term, you know, these two ways. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, a very quick last comment then from just uh, since we're making the future world here, <laughs> let me <laughs> add one comment. Uh, do not underestimate the potential of the European Union. I very much agree with what you said. And that if Europe plays its card right with a strategic alliance with Russia and uh, with development of economic, political, and cultural relations, with Muslim countries in the Mediterranean area and Middle East. The European Union can play a leading role in the construction of the new world.